So engaging your MP, uh, I mean, if you can imagine that you lived in a you know, you lived in a town that was going to ban four wheel drive vehicles, um, and you thought, well, I just go out and buy one at huge expense. I think you would probably think it was a bad idea. Uh, if they were about to be banned, why would you spend all that money getting that? So it's a very good question about about the upgrading and modernisation programme of Trident. So it can be quite a good place to start, is why, why would you do that? Do you know about the treaty? Do you know that this is the impact it's going to have? So, you know, that's, that's a, it's a way of linking the Trident arguments, which I'm sure all of us are more than, more than familiar with, with the Ban Treaty, because they are, they're, they're two sides of the same coin, but it's very easy to get pulled into some discussion about Trident that doesn't, doesn't address the moral arguments, that doesn't address the question that the UK's nuclear weapons system is predicated on the ability to disable Russia as a functioning state. It's designed to annihilate millions of people and flatten Moscow, as John Inslee used to say. So why would you be considering upgrading and modernizing a system to do that when there's a banned treaty just around the corner? So I think, um, I think that's, uh, that's why it's really important to understand what's in the treaty. There's, there's the preamble, as Tanya said, which gives the context and the reasons <coughs> behind it. And then there's the prohibitions, which are very, very extensive and include uh, investment, include um, not, not just it's not just you can't use nuclear weapons, it's you can't have them on your soil, you can't fly them through your airspace, you can't assist another country in a nuclear weapons-based alliance. So if the ban treaty is on its way, why would you want to renew Trident? So it's, a, it's one way of actually starting the argument rather than having the argument about whether the ban treaty is a good thing or not. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So it carries, <coughs> so the things you need to know about are the prohibitions, the things that it prevents you from doing, and also the positive obligations, the things that it, it makes countries responsible for, which include uh, remediation for damage to the land or to people's health, which rather than saying we're going to blame the countries that did it, it says all the countries in the treaty will work together to make that better. So if everybody else is trying to clean up Maralinga uh, while the UK government is proposing to spend more money on replacing Trident, that doesn't seem to that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, you know. Um, and the, the mechanics of how it works, of how the treaty comes into place, we've already spoken about in terms of signature and ratification. And the fact that there is this huge, glaring democratic deficit and with the position of Scotland is another argument that you can make. Uh, yeah, Tom. Yeah. Um, so just continuing on from um, what Janet has said and um, touching earlier on not having to be an expert, you don't need to you don't need to know the treaty backwards. You don't need to quote it, read it, obviously. Um, uh, and I would say have a general sense, as, I, as Janet just went through, have a general sense of where things are positioned in the treaty. And the things that you need to know broadly are that it's Article 1 that covers the prohibitions. 
Um, and then two to, to five, articles two to five, um, set out how nuclear armed states like the UK um, or dependent ally allies um, like NATO or Japan can join the treaty. Um, so while they didn't partake in the negotiations, they were actually considered. Great lengths were taken to consider how these states, because it's, it is fundamentally about those states disarming. So great pains were taken to be considerate as to how um, this could be done. Um, and in terms of lobbying efficiently, and I touched on this before, um, and not needing to know everything in the treaty, but having a sense of the familiarity with it. When you have the person or the couple of people from your organisation um, you're going to, because you may not be lobbying an MP actually, even though the intention is to have people sign the parliamentary pledge, you may be lobbying, I'm, I'm talking to people in banks, I'm talking to um, universities and technical institutions to sign a sort of a Hippocratic oath. You may be talking to anyone, um, in, depending on the context. You don't want to go to an MP with, um, and there are ways of doing this, you can, ICANN has great resources on people's voting history. Um, online you can look at parliamentary records of people's voting history and their, um, their, their statements and their platforms. There is no point lobbying someone who is a right-wing, neoliberal, um, th there is no point lobbying them on the wonderful feminist embedded, there, there's no point, it's a, waste, it's a waste of your time, it's a waste of your energy, it's not going to appeal. But if you lobby them on the economic, financial disruption and the logistical disruption it will cause because they won't be able to maneuver any of their um, fissionable materials within three kilometres of someone else's coast. They won't be able to fly through their air of potentially 122 states if they were to all ratify. That becomes a logistical nightmare, particularly financial. If you lobby on those very, very concrete, tangible <coughs> um, platforms, it becomes a very different conversation. So it's about lobbying efficient, efficiently um, on things that will appeal to them and not necessarily the things that appeal to you. So there's no point being um, emotional and passionate to someone who doesn't care. It's just a waste of your time. Um, and going into those conversations with two or three very specific arguments that you do know well, that you have uh, some good research behind, and maybe something in the text that you have, not necessarily word for word, but that you know. I know that there's this part of Article 1 um, which relates to this thing I'm saying to you. Mm -hmm. And that you can feel comfortable comfortable about. Everything else you just have a general sense of. If something comes up that they ask you or that they say and you're not sure, like I said before, I'm not entirely sure, but I'd be happy to, to forward that to you later. And if anything, it gives you an excuse to follow up. Similarly, if, you, if, you're, if you're going to st start talking to members of the Green Party, then you go back to the remediation uh, and the disproportionate impact on women and girls and so on becomes quite an important argument to be making. And it's important always to remember that the key objective, the key objective is entry into force of the treaty by the next NPT, which is 2020. That's what we're aiming at. So a key message within the UK um, is to communicate the international impact. And with some MPs, that is trying to get them to sign the, the sign the, the pledge to support it. With some people, it's actually trying to get them to be really forceful in government to try and get them to change their policy and sign the treaty itself. But it may not even be it may not even be as far as as any of that. It may be if you're dealing with certain parts of the Labour Party, for instance, it may be getting them to start worrying about the trade unions. Um, and it, so you, you constantly... Well, you uh, well if, 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 you, if you think 
that you can have an impact on a particular trade union that would get them to be supportive of the treaty for internationalist reasons, then that's going to impact on their support or otherwise of the Labour Party at a time when the Labour Party is in bits, you know. So if, if you can suggest that that might be something that is happening and at least start having that dialogue with them, and start having that conversation. <coughs> a big part of what we're trying to do is what, what, what we refer to as changing the norm, changing the, the dialogue, changing the way that we talk about nuclear weapons because that's how we change the acceptability. Um, and so taking ownership of the conversation uh, by not constantly trying to have it on your own terms, but, but, but by having it on their terms, you say that you believe in this important thing, like jobs, if yeah. you're the Labour Party. Yeah. Um, so, what's your take on the fact that this union is now having a discussion next Tuesday on their position with regard to the overall, you know. so it's it's just there are horses for courses, uh, and it's it's very important to, to to really be aware of that. I think it's important to be aware that you're never actually wasting your time if you're trying to progress a cause in nuclear disarmament, and even if you're talking to people that are uh, hardwired into it, you can still undermine them. You can still uh, you can still uh, question their assumptions and that's a very important part of changing the norm because even if that politician is not going to sign the parliamentary pledge, if they're going to feel a bit isolated in a group they're going to be less pushy with that particular line of argument because it's been knocked down by people lobbying them so often. You know, when you go back to the Vietnam War, there was a campaign that went on uh, to try and discourage the Americans from their foreign policy at the time, which involved sending little bags of rice to the president of the US. And when they were, we now know, because of the 50 year disclosure, that when the decision about whether or not to nuke Vietnam was fortunately made in a negative with a negative decision. One of the factors in making that decision was how many of these bags of rice were still arriving. Now, at the time, none of us really, you know, I mean, lots of people thought sending little bags of rice to the President of the United States, how ineffective is that? It's not. You never know. You don't know. You don't know, and they're not going to tell you. So we need to keep plugging away. The problem we have over and over again you know, it's a lobbying contacting MPs who apparently agree with us, yeah, yeah. is they're very willing to say, yes, you're right, you have to a bad thing, the government should be engaged in discussion of the treaty and should be signed to the treaty, and then they go on to publicise a completely different issue and they take no action. Mm -hmm. I, and I think, and I suppose that's deeply frustrating, and I think we probably also need to be thinking about how we... I think we need to be thinking about how we, in a sense, embarrass, maybe, might, might be one way to do it, might be encourage um, the p people who say they agree with us to actually take a public stance to do something to make this priority. And I suppose one, I mean, the pledge, the pledge. Yes, but you know, sign the pledge is you know, progress, but you know, if that's all they do, that's all they do. No, it's not, because this pledge as we said, is different. This is not just a pledge to harass the UK government. This is a pledge to work with parliamentarians from all parliaments across the world. It's a, it's a serious binding commitment to work with all parliamentarians across the world to get all the world's governments to sign up to, uh, to sign the treaty. And as soon as they've signed that pledge, you can find them things to do. And that's where ICANN, as an international campaign, comes in. Because you can find somebody in France with a similar constituency to theirs 
you can find colleagues in the US that are undertaking the non-compliance campaign to get their local authorities to disinvest. And you can, you can say, right, okay, you've signed the pledge, here's another parliamentarian in a similar situation to you, and they're going to write to you and work collaboratively with you, and oh my God, then they are under pressure to do something. And people start talking about how to get the Labour Party to change its mind uh, and adopt a, a, you know, and it's quite a big change because you have to remember it was the Labour Party that first indulged the UK in acquiring nuclear weapons in the first place, and it was the Labour Party that instigated the plans to renew Trident. So it's quite a big ask, getting them to change their minds. But how we did it in Scotland was very simple. We embarrassed them into it. Yeah. We actually, one of, the, one of the strands of our campaigning was uh, to phone up and get, get, get uh, say to prospective candidates with the Labour Party, we're going to drive a bus around the middle of Glasgow with the photographs of all the people that support the nuclear weapons that are just outside Glasgow. Do you want your face on it? <laughs> and it was quite surprising how many of them suddenly change their minds about their position on also, nuclear weapons. There's, there's tweet, the most exciting thing I heard today was about all these financial institutions which have already yeah. divested. Yeah. So for every MP or anybody else who says, well, there's not much point in this treaty, it's all the non-nuclear states, they would say that, wouldn't they? It's irrelevant to us. If major financial institutions are already seeing what's going to happen and they're divested, then every MP is going to be concerned about that. So we can say it's really having an effect now. And I didn't know that. And can I find out on a website who, yes. who they are? Yes. But don't bank on the bond. That's all about that um, financial and divestment stuff. The thing about Mythbusters is that, I mean, it's a jargon term, really. It's just like arguments that you constantly hear and how you, how you might undermine them and respond to them and uh, and finding ways of practicing doing that because that's what we need to do in groups and to we can only in one one half a day or you know we can only do a very small bit of that here today but what we can hopefully do is hand you a process that you can then undertake so what I've suggested with these mythbusters which are a mixture of uh, things that people have written and some of them are directly taken off the ICANN website which is one of the resources that you can use and what you need to do is I think is hone the skills that you already have and that you're already using you're but one of the things that well. we don't do enough of is we know in our hearts that we oppose nuclear weapons and then we we go out into the streets or we go and meet people that ch don't share our view and we try and very inarticulately put that across as something that is so deeply ingrained that we don't even have to think about it. So what today is about is, is really about looking at some of the, 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 the hows and whys. I mean, a lot of you, especially Quakers that are here, will have seen Tim Wallace's book, The Truth About Trident, which uh, is, is really a giant expanded myth-busting book which goes into all the different arguments that you could make uh, about, about how to do this stuff. And you need to be meeting and honing your arguments and Mythbusters is one very good way of doing it. If you get four or five of you that are prepared to meet each other of an evening, go through those Mythbusters, practice the arguments, decide whether the arguments are right for you or not, score them out, write your own Mythbusters, discuss it, but don't just, don't just say they're all wrong for thinking these things. Actually, fine-tune what are the clear arguments that you can make against them. And if you don't have them, and the, the, what's on that bit of paper doesn't work for you, write something else, and then practice saying it, saying the words out loud.